I decided not to. Jessica did tell me, she was like, don't disappoint that fact then when you get up there. So, Well, we all know uh, what optical illusions are. You know, we've all seen optical illusions or pictures. You know, they're images that play tricks on our eyes or, or mind, and they make us think something is either going on in the picture. We think that the picture is moving in some way, or, or maybe we think it makes us think that there's something there that isn't really there in the image. So I've got some here uh, that I'll pull up here in a second. They may come through on the screen. I don't know if, since it's a projector and screen, uh, I should have tested this, but I just now realized I didn't test it. So hopefully it works. Uh, yeah, that one works. All right, so I don't know if when you look at that, those lines that are going uh, left to right, so horizontal, those are actually parallel. But when you look at it, it looks like they kind of bend in one way, maybe. And so some people, they, they don't see optical illusions. They look at it and they're like, OK, I don't get it all. So you may not see it. If that's the case, well, this might be kind of boring for you. Um, but for me, at least when I look at it, it looks like they are, they're not parallel. Or this one, I don't know if you move your eyes around. Oh, yeah, that doesn't work. All right, but you might have seen that one. If you look on your screen, you know, it looks like there's black dots in the corners there, and so, uh, let's see here. This one might be kind of hard, but if you like move your head kind of, it looks like it moves a little bit. It looks like the image kind of moves this way. And then this last one is really kind of the main one that I really wanted us to focus on. Look at his feet. All right, if you look, if you follow the feet, the feet actually aren't connected to the body. And so, you know, it's kind of one of those things that kind of plays a trick on your mind. You kind of have to, wait, something's not right there. And so you kind of have to look at it. And so tonight, we're going to be talking about a battle that sometimes we think is really there. It's a battle we think that's going on. We think it's a real life battle. But the truth is, there really is no battle. And this battle is almost like an illusion, perhaps. We think it's there. You know, our mind almost kind of plays a trick on us, and we think it's real, but the truth is this battle doesn't really exist. But before we get into that, let's turn over uh, to Romans. That's where we'll be for most of the evening. And so Romans, you can be turning there. You know, for the month of April, we're doing the 30-day challenge. And if you are reading along with us, today you, uh, read, you, you're in Romans. Yesterday and today you're reading Romans. And I don't know about you, but for me... I, I'm really glad that we're doing this 30-day challenge. For me, sometimes I think, all right, where do I begin reading the Bible? Because a lot of the stories, I'm like, okay, I know the stories, and so it can be kind of hard to think, all right, I'm going to read here or read here. But you give me a schedule, and for me, it's like, all right, I got this. You know, I can, I can do this. I know where to start, where to begin. And so I hope you're, you're taking part of that 30-day challenge. Um, if you haven't, and you're thinking, oh, it's too late, uh, well, you can start now, and you'll just go a little longer than the rest of us. Or if you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of chapters a day, you know, seven chapters, eight chapters a day. Uh, I kind of looked at, did some math. If you start today and did two chapters a day of Matthew, you'll, you'll actually finish Matthew by the end of April. So maybe you've kind of fallen off the wagon or whatever, and you want to do some kind of challenge. You can do, take the Matthew challenge. That's my very own challenge I just came up with. So uh, I'll have Howell make a logo for me on that. Uh, but like I said, we're doing Romans. Uh, yesterday and today, you should be reading Romans. And so I was kind of thinking, well, let's kind of do tonight's sermon based on what we're reading with the 30-day challenge. So let's talk about Romans as a whole. Well, it's a letter to the church in Rome. Um, some scholars believe that the letter was actually written to, Christ to people in Rome who were already Christians. And so these are people, baptized believers who've already been baptized. They are Christians. And they also believe that Paul has not visited Rome yet. And so he's writing this letter to the Romans, and he's writing it in the, such the way that he's showing them this message. Uh, he's basically writing a resume about himself. He's talking about the gospel of Christ, but he's showing what he believes about Christ. And so it's kind of almost a faith resume, in the sense you could think. Uh, he's talking about what this message is from God, and he's showing that it is from God. And so he's writing to the church there in Rome, and we'll begin in chapter 1, actually. 
chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. This key word gospel is going to be it's very important throughout all of Romans. And so right here it says, set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And then jump down to verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And so for much of this letter, Paul's focused on the gospel, this idea of the gospel, the good news that Christ brings. And that good news is grace, salvation, freedom from sin. And in fact, if we were to look at Romans and we were to make an outline of the letter, we can kind of see an outline in, in this way. Uh, it's pretty simple. You can write this down if you are a note taker. If we were to look at chapters 1 through 3, it kind of talks about sin's rule or sin's power over mankind. And so chapters 1 through 3, Paul spends talking about sin's power over man or sin's rule. And we could call that almost maybe past. All right, and so it's in the past. And then we come to chapters 4 through 6, or sorry, 4 through 8. And this is kind of when Christ comes. What Christ does to sin and how he frees us from sin. And, and where Adam brought death, Christ brings life. And so we talk, there's a lot of talk about the power of Christ and why Christ had to come. And he brings salvation through faith. And so chapters 4 through 8, let's call that maybe present. So chapters 1 through 3 was past. It was the past sin's rule. Chapters 4 through 8, it's present, the idea of Christ coming. And then we come to chapters 9 through 16, and we call, could call that maybe God's rule, or kind of this idea of how do we live our lives after Christ? And so God now rules our life. God is in control. And so what does our life look like now? And so that could, we're going to call that kind of future. And so we've got past, present, and future. And if we look at that kind of the idea of kind of the spectrum of the Bible, you know, that kind of tells the story that, you know, past the law, the sin had its power, then Christ came, and then God rules in the end. That's kind of also a timeline for our, our, our life as well, that we had the past, sin had its rule over our life. We turn to Christ, and that brief moment when we turn to Christ, we're, we are, we're baptized, we're forgiven of sin, that, that present... And then from then on, the future, God rules our life. And so God is now in control of our life. Sin no longer has control of our life. And so that outline is going to come into play in what we look at for our main text tonight. But just kind of store that away in your memory. This idea of a past, present, and future, it's, it's going to be kind of a strong undertone throughout much of what we're talking about tonight. So let's begin our main text is John, or sorry, not John, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore there is now no condemn condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And then jump down to verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. 
The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of flesh cannot please God. And so here Paul makes a clear distinction. He says there's two possible paths. You know when you travel somewhere, you can type it in your GPS or Google Maps, you get all these different routes. You could take highways, you could take city streets, you could take the scenic route, take back roads. You could even choose whether to avoid toll roads or take the toll roads. You've got all these different options, all these different possibilities to get where you're going. But here Paul says there's two choices. Two distinct paths, and there's only two. You can live according to the sinful nature or or flesh or the body. Some translations say flesh, some say sinful nature. It's all this idea of, it's the Greek word is sarx, and so it's flesh, this this sinful nature, the sinful self. You can live that way, or there's another option. You can live according to the spirit, and that's really it. There's only two options, kind of like a fork in the road. Are you going to follow sin, or are you going to follow Christ or the Spirit? And here Paul even helps us. He tells us what the destination is for each path. You know, there, there's no mystery of, oh, what's that path lead to? or what's, He tells us plainly that the option of living according to the flesh or to the sinful nature leads to death. But the option of spirit is life and peace. You know, two completely different options and two completely different destinations. Body or spirit, death or life. Two options. That's what we're faced with. But Paul's not done yet. You know, he continues on. In verse 9, he starts off, he says, You, however, or maybe it says, but you. And so who is the you? Well, the audience of the letter, obviously, who at this time, like we said earlier, they are baptized believers, they are Christians. So you as Christians, or you as followers of Christ. So Paul's saying, but followers of Christ, and we have this word, but or however. You know, we've got a a transition. You know, he told us about the two options, and he started to talk about one option, living by the flesh. And then we have this, you however, or But you, followers of Christ, there's something unique about you. There's something different. And so he continues, verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Paul says, but we as followers of Christ are not controlled by the sinful nature. We're not controlled by the flesh, but instead... We are controlled by the Spirit. And you know that word, that word control. You know, we as humans, we may not like that idea of someone controlling us. You know, I'm my own person. I want to do my own thing. You can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me how to act or live my life. I'm my own person. And so we hear that idea of control, that the Spirit controls us. And we kind of think, I don't know if I like that. But it's not controlling us by force. You know, I remember when I was a kid, my, my brother and I, you know, we, we'd fight like all siblings are supposed to do. And, you know, sometimes one of us would try to control the other one. And so, you know, we'd put them in a headlock or something, or maybe we'd, you know, p- twist their arm behind their back to, you know, try to get them to do what we wanted. It's this idea of controlling them by force. But that's not the kind of control that Paul's talking about here. He's not saying the Spirit controls us by force or, you know, the Spirit of God isn't putting us in a headlock in in some way to make us do something. But look at verse 10. It says, The body is dead, but the Spirit is alive. We now live by the Spirit because it's the only thing living in us. The body or, or sin has been put to death. And so there's no other option. 
So the Spirit doesn't control us by force. It's not trying to take control of our life by putting it in a headlock or anything like that. There's no other option because there's nothing there for the Spirit to take control of because the body or sinful nature is dead. It's done away with. And so the only option is to live by the Spirit. And so let's kind of look back at this idea of, of the optical illusion. You know, like this one, for example. We look at it and we think, oh, the feet should be right below it, but it's actually off. And so, you know, it kind of plays, <clears throat> plays with our mind in some way. You know, this is a lot like what we're finding in Romans chapter 8. You know, sometimes as Christians, we might think that there's some kind of battle going on beside, inside of us, this good versus evil, and waiting to see who's going to win. Right now, I'm, uh, I'm kind of geeking out right now at our house. Uh, I, I decided I'm going to watch all, epi- all six episodes of Star Wars bef- in a row before I see the new one that just came out. And so, <laughs> and so you know, you kind of have this... Uh, Force versus the dark side, kind of, you know, this battle going on, good versus evil. And, you know, we see this all in movies and and, and media, books, you know, the good versus evil. It's a common theme, common storyline. And I think sometimes as Christians we might think, you know, that's going on inside of us as well. And we wait to see, you know, who's going to win in my life? Is good going to win or is evil going to win? You know, it's, it's like these two sides are competing inside of our heart, or competing even for our heart. And it's a question of who will win. But Paul says, you know, that, that's not true. This battle is all an illusion. That there is no battle. He says that if we've chosen to follow God, if we've committed to Christ, then the flesh, the sinful nature, is dead. And the only thing now living is the spirit. The life of sin is dead. It's done away with. And so the battle has already been won. And it continues no more. There's no more battle between good and evil. I've committed to Christ. I've put that sinful nature to death. And so there's nothing for the Spirit to fight against. And so the Spirit, if I've put that to death, if I've truly put that to death and committed my life to Christ, then the Spirit should have ultimate rule of my life. And it's not trying to take back control of anything. There's no force because I've already committed to it. I've willingly, freely committed to let the Spirit control my life. I've put the sinful nature, the flesh, to death. You know, Paul in another letter talks about the same idea to another audience. If you want to turn over to Galatians, we'll see the same idea in his letter to the church in Galatia as well. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul writes, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. You know, from the beginning here, Paul talks about Christ giving himself for our sins and rescuing us from this evil age. You know, when I, when I think of this idea of rescuing Someone, for me, I, don't, I was thinking of, you know, what, can I, what comes to mind when I think of rescuing? And for me, I thought of a lifeguard. You know, a lifeguard, and someone's drowning, you know, at a, at a pool or whatever. And the lifeguard, they come to their rescue. And I thought, you know, when a, res, when a lifeguard rescues someone, they get in the water with them. And they don't just, once they, you know, get control of the person, you know, let the person know, okay, you're good. They don't just leave them there in the water. Instead, the lifeguard's job, mentality really, is to get them out of the water. He dives in to that water, to their present situation, and takes them out of the water. He rescues them, brings them out of it. And so here when Jesus is talking about this idea, or sorry, when Paul is talking about this idea that Jesus rescued us from this present evil age, I get this idea, you know, Pulled us out of that evil age to put it to death. And so let's turn over to Galatians, turn over to chapter 2 there in Galatians, verse 20. Pretty common verse. It says, I've been crucified with Christ. 
and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, I have been crucified. Myself has been put to death. My flesh has been crucified, and now Christ lives in me. You know, doesn't that sound like a lot like what we read in Romans chapter 8, where something has been put to death, and something else has moved into its place? And it's this new thing that doesn't have to compete with anything. Because everything else has been crucified. Everything else has been moved away. It's been thrown out. And really the Spirit just moves in. Let's stick in Galatians and jump to chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. So I say walk or live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Live by the Spirit. Really similar to what we looked at in Romans chapter 8, verse 9 through 11. We talked about the two options earlier, where you had the option of following a lot of sinful nature or flesh, or following the Spirit, living by the Spirit. Two options, and it's a question of what will we choose? What will control our lives? And the truth is that if we live by the Spirit, if we let the Spirit control our life, then there is no flesh or sinful nature because it has been put to death. It's been crucified, as we looked at in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And so here in Galatians 5, Paul spends some time contrasting the sinful nature of to the Spirit. And he talks about what each one produces. And so if you were to look in verse 19 and following, you see that the sinful nature acts, you know, you've got sexual immorality, impurity, idolatry, jealousy, fits of rage, uh, anger, selfish ambition, drunkenness, envy. All those things are produced or fruits of the sinful nature. But then we jump down to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. No law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so if we live by the Spirit, these are the things in our life. The love, joy, peace, patience, the fruits of the Spirit. These are are things that we are to produce, that we are to grow in our own lives. But notice again, he says that if we belong to Christ, we've put to death the sinful nature. It's been crucified. There is no battle. It's been put to death. The Spirit has already won. If we make that commitment, the sinful nature is to be put to death. It isn't even an option for it to be there, because it's been put to death, and so the Spirit is the only thing that's there, and so we are only live by the Spirit. And so we now live by the Spirit. So let's go back to Romans and see kind of what that means. If you remember, we were talking about our outline for Romans. We had the past, talking about sin's rule. Then we talked about present, which is Christ's coming. And then there's that moment where we in our own lives commit to Christ. We make that decision to follow Christ. And then from then on is the future. From that moment on when we commit to Christ, it is the future. And that's when God rules our life. And so in Romans chapters 9 through 16, much of what Paul is talking about is, all right, now that God rules your life, this is how you are to live. And so there's a lot of application, a lot of uh, applicable things we can pull from. But I want us to notice just kind of one thing in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, this sums up what it means to live according to the Spirit. We offer our bodies as a sacrifice to God. We no longer live like the world. We no longer conform to the world. We now choose to follow God. We live this holy life. And as followers of Christ, this is how we are to live. Sin is dead. There's no longer this, or there's no longer supposed to be this internal battle of good versus evil, waiting to see who's going to win in the end. Because really the only competitor is to be the spirit. The sinful nature of the flesh is to be dead. It can't come back to life. It can't resurrect. So it's done away with. The sinful nature of the flesh, it's done away with. We no longer are to give in to it. There is no battle. And so we have to think about our own lives. Have I truly put the sinful nature, have I put sin to death? And if I have, what does that mean? How, how does that mean I now live? You know, am I watching movies with sex, violence, or language if I've put the sinful nature to death? Am I spreading rumors and gossip and text messages if I've put the body to death? Are words of hate and anger on my lips if I've put the sinful nature to death? Am I spending my time wisely by playing video games for hours upon hours if I've put the body to death? If I've put the body to death and now live by the Spirit, where do I find my own personal gratification? Do I, do I find it in drugs? Do I find it in a girlfriend or boyfriend? Do I find it in food? Do I find it in words of praise, perhaps? But if we've put the body to death and live by the Spirit, then our fulfillment is found in God alone. You know, if there's one thing I wanted us all to get out, get out of tonight's lesson, it's this. Live by the Spirit. What can I do tomorrow? Where can I improve my life on Monday morning? What do I need to remove from my life? What do I need to fill my life with this week so that I can live by the Spirit? If there's anything we can do for you tonight, if we can pray for you in any way, if tonight is the night where you think, all right, I'm committing my life to Christ. I'm putting the flesh, the sinful nature, I'm putting that to death and I'm going to turn over my life to Christ. I'm going to let the Spirit now control me. I'm going to commit to Christ. I'm going to enter into the waters of baptism. I'm going to be baptized, become a follower of His and be forgiven of my sin. If there's anything we can do for you tonight, please come now as we stand and sing.